I know something about Islam. I met many Muslims in the making of a book about Iranian immigration that I edited. I also photographed and interviewed a large number of people in that community. There are all sorts of Muslims, good, bad, and ugly, and a broad range from secular people to traditionalists, the same as any other faith. And when I lived in Los Angeles, I counted a variety of individuals of Muslim heritage among my friends and acquaintances. I was also involved in a book about Yemeni immigration to the United States, and I've got an article in another book about Muslims in metropolitan Los Angeles. For that project, I eventually interviewed over 130 Muslims from over 30 countries. I recently picked up a movie for a buck at a thrift shop, a PBS documentary called Muhammad, Legacy of a Prophet. Long ago, I was a believer in PBS and what it stood for, but nowadays, I vaguely trust it for movies about bugs and maybe the planet Mars, but not much else, certainly nothing in the socio-political realm. The film in question came out in 2002, the year after 9-1-1 and the Twin Towers attack. There was widespread suspicion and hostile public opinion to Muslims and Islam, so it's a typical PBS be tolerant socio-political puff job, in this case about how wonderful Islam is. Sure, there are some nice things about the faith, but there are plenty of things to criticize or question about Islam, as is the case for any other religion. But this film's foundational attitude is the way the Vatican itself would produce a film about Catholicism. In portraying Islam as a wonderful, unified, universalistic whole, the movie completely ignores, for instance, key divisions within the Islamic religion, most poignantly the Shia-Sunni conflict, which has been around since Muhammad died. Although the film doesn't mention it, this group of praying Muslims in the movie appears to be Shia. Sunnis usually fold their hands to their chest at prayer. Shias don't do that. You can also tell by the little round pieces of clay on the floor. When Shia pray, it is tradition to touch their heads to it. A Shia once gave me one. This is it. Typically, this clay comes from Karbala, a holy place for Shia because there was a famous battle there between Muslims, those who became Sunni and those who became Shia, over leadership succession after Muhammad died. One of the religious leaders interviewed in the film is Hassan Ghazvini. His last name is anglicized in various ways. He is Shia and presides over the largest Shia mosque in the United States in Dearborn, Michigan. This fact of his specific Islamic allegiance is not mentioned in the film. I once interviewed his father, Morteza Ghazvini, at his home then in metropolitan Los Angeles. That's a photograph of Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini on the wall, the religious leader who is famous for, among other things, declaring a religious-based death edict against author Salman Rushdie, who was stabbed by a Muslim attacker in 2022. By the way, and this is also crucial to what you're going to see here, PBS has aired many critical films in recent years slamming Catholicism, Hand of God, and even a film called Secrets of the Vatican, described by PBS as, quote, an inside look at the scandals that rocked Pope Benedict's papacy, unquote. Take a look. Frontline reveals the bitter power struggles. If I don't get a response from you, I go public. Sexual scandal and abuse. If you tell anybody, your parents will burn in hell. And crime and corruption at the heart of the Vatican. Secrets of the Vatican. By 2014, years ago, the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights counted a running total of 48 what it called hits by PBS against the Catholic Church. Legitimate or not, keep this open avalanche of Catholic bashing in mind as we discuss PBS's Muhammad apologetics about how great Islam is. But that's only a sidelight to what we're going to discuss here. There's more, something astoundingly more, an outrageous PBS blindness in service to its obsessively tolerate diversity politic, not recognizing literally what is sometimes a screaming truth under their noses. Okay. In watching the Muhammad movie, very quickly the objective viewer recognizes that the film has an obvious purpose, to propagandize the PBS audience away from a variety of news items that had and has engendered widespread negative feelings about Islam. They know very little about the faith of Islam. They think that the faith of Islam is um, a very, maybe, terroristic, militant, barbaric, spread-by-the-sword faith. 
And so when they have a Muslim up there talking about patient rights, dignity, issues around health and illness, all of a sudden you see all of these stereotypes that people have as part of you know the baggage as we grow up just kind of fall. Jihad is misused. There is absolutely nothing in Islam that justifies uh, the claim of Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, or other similar groups to kill innocent civilians. That is unequivocally a crime under Islamic law. Acts of terror violence that have occurred in the name of Islam are not only wrong, they are contrary to Islam. Imagine my shock then when I discovered that this movie as a promotional propaganda piece for Islam has what may be the most spectacular blunder in the history of documentary cinema, one that seems to turn this very self-consciously pro-Islam effort into a virtual indictment of that faith and the wrecking of PBS as an objective truth teller. And an online search reveals that there has never been much attention to the bizarre fact I'm going to show you. We must start here with a notorious Muslim terrorist named Anwar al-Awlaki, born in America of Yemeni descent. When residing in that Muslim country in 2011, he was controversially assassinated via drone attack by order of President Barack Obama. Earlier this morning, Anwar al-Awlaki, a leader of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, was killed in Yemen. The death The death of al is a major blow to Al-Qaeda's most active operational affiliate. al was the leader of external operations for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. In that role, he took the lead in planning and directing efforts to murder innocent Americans. What he is saying from wherever he is in Yemen to his minions that it is not only legitimate to kill Americans, that's the message that most people got, but that it is also permissible to kill American Muslims. So what's this got to do with the PBS movie? Deep in the film, a Muslim U.S. government staffer in Washington, D.C., Jamil Johnson, chief of staff for Congressman Gregory Meeks, is interviewed. And this man leads the movie to a weekly prayer meeting of fellow believers, mostly those in the ranks of U.S. government. I almost fell out of my chair when I saw who was leading these prayers. I recognized the face. One of the narrations. Johnson coordinates the Friday prayer service, or Jummah, on Capitol Hill. It's grown since we started it. It used to be sometimes three, five, ten of us. Now there can be up to 40, 50 people were busting out of the room that we're in as an example it's kind of a re-energizing kind of refilling our fuel tank with faith again for the rest of the week the image of the messenger gives us an example of somebody who was extremely successful as a head of state nevertheless he never had to compromise his integrity this guy leading Muslim congressional staffers in prayer is the terrorist President Obama ordered assassinated nine years later. Don't consult with anybody in the killing of Americans. Fighting the devil doesn't require consultation or prayers seeking divine guidance. They are the party of the devils. Fox News is one of the few media outlets that ever addressed al presence at the Congressional Staff Muslim Prayer Meeting in the PBS film. That piece notes eight other eyebrow-raising presences at this prayer meeting, including Randall Ismail Royer, who, quote, confessed in 2004 to receiving jihadist training in Pakistan, unquote, and was sentenced to a 20-year prison term. The prayer meeting shown in this film, featuring the Congressional Muslim Staff Association, doesn't seem to exist anymore. I wonder why. Here, apparently, is Randall Ismail Royer in the PBS film at the al led Congressional Prayer Meeting, and here, after 14 years in prison, are his views as a reformed Muslim extremist. Right, and people, you know, a lot of the Muslims 
you know, have this, you know, affection for Anwar al-Alaqi, even though they may not agree with his, you know, what he was into later. They have this mythological, romantic notion of him being this person who was speaking truth to power. And so, in reality, I mean, this person was, you know, Anwar, and he's, by the way, Anwar al-Alaqi is intimately connected with my case, as I just tweeted something this, this morning um, about that. But in any event, um, you know, this is a person who was calling on Muslims in the West to kill any American non-Muslim that he could find. So, you know, this is a person who, you know, can't har can hardly complain about being blown up. You know, so, I mean, I mean so how, and then how do you? And then you have Muslims saying, "Oh, they killed Imam Anwar just for what he was saying." You know, well, no, you know, no. I mean, he, he you know, he, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. You know, so I, I don't lament these people being, you know, blown up, you know, or killed where they were. The Muslims should have done it instead of the United States. That's how I look at it. But you can still buy the film Muhammad, Legacy of a Prophet from PBS. Is there a disclaimer in the film today? Something like, uh, the Prophet Muhammad has nothing to do with terrorist Al-Alaki, who leads Muslim congressional staffers in prayer in this film. Or is the blind propaganda still allowed to flow with no mention of the catastrophic problem of El Alaki in such a film, with the hope that no one notices that an Obama-certified Muslim terrorist anchors this movie towards the direction it begs you not to go? There's an enormous problem for PBS here. The presence of Alaki so influentially in the movie seems to prove what the movie otherwise labors to disprove, that Islam is not a benevolent faith to those who are not Muslim, and that a Muslim terrorist in sheep's clothing could be your next door neighbor. This outrageous gaffe underscores the failure of the prejudicial ideology of the film and PBS itself. PBS defames the Catholic Church, for example, with repeated impunity, but it walks on eggshells around other faiths, like Islam. Why? The answer to that question would be an interesting film itself, would it not? It would serve everyone well, including Muslims, to do an honest film about Islam, including internal conflicts and troubles, the range of interpretations of sacred Islamic texts, and its various sects and divisions that do not see eye to eye and that have rocked the faith since its founding. Anwar al-Alaki's surreal presence in such film fluff and its implications screams for such an open investigation, an educational effort that could be fair but honest, and not so grotesquely embarrassing and homage to taxpayer-sponsored religious and political myth-making. With all the muckraking by PBS into the Catholic Church and its sex scandals and all, it didn't have much parallel interest in investigating Alaki's two arrests for soliciting prostitutes when he led a mosque in San Diego, part of his personal history before the Muhammad movie was made, well before he became the number one terrorist target of President Obama. He was actually also under FBI surveillance starting in September of 2001, a few months before the PBS film was first shown. FBI documents, and they're online at a National Archives site, Note that after Alaki's move to the Washington, D.C. area, he had continued to regularly patronize prostitutes at usually $300 to $400 per visit, and Alaki, the prayer leader, was a married man. Nor was PBS curious, like Fox News, about how such a man was invited, incredibly, to Pentagon dinners via outreach programs to the Muslim community. And guess what? This wonderful film is widely used in schools to study Islam. According to Wikipedia, quote, The film is used in communities, schools, universities, religious congregations, and civic organizations throughout the United States to increase Americans' understandings of Muslims and Islam. Guides to facilitate discussions of the film's themes are available through the 20,000 Dialogues Project and the Islam Project. The DVD of the film was reissued in 2011 and includes the dialogue guide and lesson plans for teachers to use the film in the classroom." Unquote. Do you think there is any discussion about Alaki here? Anything at all? And what does disturbing presence suggest in this movie? So the ultimate burning question remains ignored by PBS and so many others, intentionally disregarded in homage to the secular faith of diversity and toleration 
even if some of those tolerated reject that concept themselves as a moral principle. In the absolute prohibition of raising troubling questions for fear of stereotyping, evil people and ideas exploit America's institutional dictate of anti-prejudice so easily they can coast all the way to even access influential people in the American government. And this brings us to a profound query in our modern era. Beyond all the delusionary puff that is the PBS film and the single-minded fluff radiating from it, how did such an influential American Muslim prayer leader, and there is only one other actual official Muslim religious leader in the PBS film, and the other of whom it would be interesting to know his sentiments about some of the religious edicts of Ayatollah Khomeini, come to understand that the tenets of Islam directed him to the merciless path he ultimately chose in violent hatred against all Americans, and even Muslims who do not agree with his own interpretation of sacred Islamic literature. This question is so core to today's conflicts in the Muslim community and so uncomfortable a topic that the PBS film cannot be found within 100 miles of it, even as Alaki's haunting presence proclaims what his own version of Islam is from the propagandistic bedrock of this very movie itself, a film that otherwise begs you to ignore what you can shockingly see with your own eyes. Who is fairly successful as a head of state, nevertheless, he never had to compromise his integrity.